Salute, mob tube. How's everybody doing? Uh, we are plagued by technical difficulties. I'm not sure if this show is going to happen, but we're working on it. If nothing else, then uh, maybe I'll get a gun smoke on and maybe one or two other people and uh, we'll have a little... We'll have a little gathering on YouTube, but hopefully the Sorellis will be on to tell us some more information about themselves and their family. Uh, they got a, a little article they want to show and, um, and a little recording, or should I say a snippet, um, I think from a documentary. Um, yeah, it sounds about right. I think it's like an hour and a half. I'm not sure. Um, Nino Brazil, respect to you too, my friend. Carol, always nice to see you. Hello. Mickey Griggs, Anthony Ray Mundy, Jen Jen, Cuban B, Florida Attorney. Yes, everybody hit the like button, please. Uh, FBS, did you order a pizza? LOL. <laughs> well, let's not get into that. <laughs> um, let's see, this can't be wrong. Uh, I think I already shouted out U.S. Army Combat Medic. Yeah, I did. Because I think we do live uh, live about an hour and a half away from each other. Um, Lexi Johnson, Facts Over Feelings, Edward Everett. Uh-oh. Um, let me move this a little closer. <clears throat> I'm waiting for Jimmy and Marie Sorelli. Jimmy is having issues um, linking on to the show. And Marie, it doesn't look like she's going to make it because at this point she is in the boonies, I believe, in Florida. And she, can, uh, she can't get on. Her Wi-Fi just isn't cooperating. But stick with me, guys. Give me a few minutes here. And like I said, we'll do something fun. I guarantee you that. Dana Smith, I'll be honest with you, I'm um, done with the subject. I'm done with uh, talking about all these guys. Let them do their own thing, um, however they want to do it. I'm moving on with my show, and uh, I'm going to put out some quality content. Anthony Salerno, F FBS, you said you were in Hackensack. If you ever come back to Hackensack, New Jersey, stop by Bakery Crumb Cake. Dog is off the hook. Oh, stop by B stop BB Bakery Crumb Cake. Dog is off the hook. I think that's what you were trying to say. All right. I think we got uh I think we got Jimmy. Let me give him a few seconds here to get get ready. I'm not sure if he's ready yet. Gunsmoke, my man. Jimmy Sorelli. You hear me? Chris. Yeah. Oh, you got to do it this way? All right, all right, all right. I got you. I see why he was calling now. Leave your message for... Shit. Hello. Okay. Uh, Marie can't get on at all, so I'm on under her uh, Gmail account. So. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. All right. We're good then. All right. Everybody, welcome Jimmy Sorelli. Uh, I love having Jimmy on and his sister Marie. Unfortunately, she can't make it tonight. You guys already know some stuff about them, but for new subscribers and people who don't, Jimmy and Marie Sorelli are the great niece and nephew of Mikey and Nettie Sorelli. Mikey was a wise guy with the Gambino family. And Nettie uh, was Mikey's wife who lived in the Ravenite or li li sorry, lived above the Ravenite. Uh, when the infamous yeah, she, no, you, you were right the first time. Yeah, yeah. 
lived above the Ravenite when the, the uh, Gotti tapes, you know, when Gotti was caught on those tapes that eventually put him away for life. Um, so I will let Jimmy go on. If you want to tell a, if you want to reintroduce anybody to yourself and your story, go right ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm G I'm Jimmy Sorelli, uh, originally from Long Island. Uh, unfortunately, my sister can't come on, uh, but we are the great niece and nephew of Michael Sorelli and Nettie Sorelli. Uh, my father, you know, his side of the family uh, grew up down on Mulberry Street, and uh, they've been around the Gambinos since the 40s. Uh, my father's uh, uncle, Mike, was the caretaker of the Raven Night, like Chris said, uh, since its inception. Uh, his underboss was Emilio Delacroach, who happened to be my aunt's godfather. And they were paisans uh, with the Delacroach, who was the underboss on, up till the time that he passed. And uh, it's, you know, very historic family. Uh, my aunt still lives around there. My sister moved in with my father in 79 and was there until 1982. And I moved in with him from 82 to 1990. You know? So it was uh, during those times when the recordings were made. And, uh, you know, it, it was just... Uh, a treasure trove of information that was uh, being recorded up there, and it made history. Yeah, it certainly did. And I know some of you have already heard this. I don't mean for us to be repetitive, but it is important to mention that one thing that Jimmy and Marie filled us in on was the fact that, Jimmy, can you hear me? Uh, is the fact that the official story yeah i watched you yeah the official story of how they actually uh got that bug into netty sorelli's apartment is not true the fbi said that um netty went on vacation to florida for thanksgiving and that's not true so i'll let jimmy um go over that one more time for everybody who hasn't heard it before yeah so, and uh yeah. Like the articles that we pulled up today that i sent you when they they first were trying to find out where John Gotti Sr. was going, having his conversations, they they bugged the Ravenite. They they had the uh, music too loud; they couldn't hear anything. They bugged the hallway. When I understand, they even bugged in front of the building. And finally, they figured out because they were watching across the street. Every day around, I guess around noontime, my aunt would leave uh, for two hours and come back at the same time. And they figured something out. They went in the building, looked at the mailbox, seen the name Sorelli, and checked and said, hey, wait, there's a Mike Sorelli that was a made guy. He passed on now, but like, he was above. So maybe that's, that's where they're going. So I don't know how long after that, but they posed as content workers, knocked on the door, said there was a gas leak. They needed a week to take care of it. And they said, look, uh, wherever you want to go, we'll send you. You know, content will pay for it. She went to Vegas with her nephew. Came back, I guess, a week. It was during Thanksgiving. And they did what they had to do. They, they put their bugs everywhere, from what I understand, the TV, the VCR, the, the uh, wax ball of fruit. Any place that they can, uh, you know, get the get the recordings, you know, that were understandable. And that's how they got them. Yeah. So this story right here that you see, this is not the true story. Uh, I don't want to cut you off, Jimmy, but I have a I have a special guest that wants to join us and say hi to you. Uh, so let me welcome Jimmy Calandra. Hey, there he is. What's, What's up, up Paisan? How are you? Uh, uh, I'm trying to figure this computer stuff out. I went and bought a, a notebook. My wife tried to program it. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm old school like everybody, like like you and Chris. <laughs> it sounds you know. like me. 
<laughs> Give me the old uh, Enterprise walkie-talkies, you know, when we were kids. Those are the best. What's up, guys? So, so what are you up to tonight? What's the conversation? Uh, we're discussing um, how the the feds actually got into Nettie Sorelli's apartment to, to plant that bug. Oh, okay. So uh, Jimmy's just telling us the story about, have you heard it, Jimmy, that, you know, they said I, that. Yeah, I, I heard this story. Uh, he was telling it once before. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I heard this story. Something with your aunt, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I did some more digging today, and I found an article. I also went on Sammy's uh, podcast, season one, Tipping Point, and it had the agent, George Gabriel, telling his version of it, and it wasn't nowhere near what happened. Because when my grandmother passed away on the way to the cemetery, she was in the limousine with us, Nettie, and my back then, my future wife, and she just started telling us the story. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, well, that's not what they've been saying. She says, no. She says, this is what happened. And then, like, a couple days later, her apartment got robbed. And she got upset. She went downstairs into the club, and she says, look, my, my whole apartment got robbed. Crooks, no crooks. I want to know what happened. It's not my fault that they did what they did. They bugged my apartment. My, my husband's been dead since he died in, what, 19... 84, I believe, Mike D died. This and that. And and the poor woman, uh, I think she was 91 years old when she passed. He was she was dead for like two days. God bless My you. uncle uh went to check on her and he found her dead on the floor. And she was a sweet woman. Worked yeah. at Macy's for over 30 years in Harold Square, customer service. I spoke to her only a couple of times. She hardly ever came out of the apartment unless to go shopping. And that was it. She was a sweet woman. How's your sister? We're trying to get her on, but uh, she's doing okay. She's down in Florida. Okay, nice. She's having problems, too. Yeah, she's having issues getting on, Jimmy. Uh, it's not working out. Oh, you're both, Jimmy. What am I? Uh, I got to address you both. So, Jimmy uh, Calandra, what do you think about is the story that you always heard the same as the story we all heard that Nettie Sorelli went to Thanksgiving for Florida? Well, it's some somewhat like that, you know. I heard that she she uh, went somewhere, and then they came in. They bugged the house. I really don't know the whole story, you know. But uh, you know, this is what the feds do. You know, when they want you, they get you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, they have all these devices, all this equipment. They have all this time to just sit in their car. And watch you and put together a case on you. So, you know, you got to be really smart to beat them. Yeah. And like I was telling Chris the last couple of podcasts, Jimmy, uh, the stories that this they're, they're saying it's not even near. And he even he even turns around and he says that my uncle owned the building. Joe the cat owned the building. And Norman Dupont was my aunt's uh, nephew. He was the caretaker for a little bit after my uncle passed. Then my father took it over. Yeah. So, yeah. well, back well back then, you know what? That was some neighborhood, you know, growing up back then in that neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, I knew a couple people on that block. Some guy Sal, that was uh, he was connected. I used to sell some weed with him. But uh, yeah, you know, those times, those were the best times back then. Oh, yeah. You know, again, I'm originally from Long Island. I moved in with my father the end of 82, and I moved out in 1990, moved back to Long Island. But those nine years that I was there, it was, I grew up, you know, I became a man, you know, totally I initiated. Different. I'll tell you, a totally different world from Mulberry Street, Mott Street to Long Island. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I told Chris, I didn't come out when I first moved in with my father. I stood up uh, up the apartment, and he says, no, no, you got to come down. You got to. I want you to hit the streets. First night, I got beat up by 13 Italian kids. Got initiated. My, uncle, my, my cousin stood there and watched. I went home with my pants and my shirt, my sneakers over my shoulder, in my underwear, 
walk to Lafayette Street. My father came home. He goes, what happened? My face was all scratched up. Yeah, this and that. He says, you got initiated, huh? I'm like, yeah. Next day I went down, same thing. 13 Italian kids. I didn't cry. I didn't I get revenge, nothing. I took it. I took it like a man, and that was it. After, after that, I was accepted. Well, you know what? That's how that back then, that's how the neighborhoods were. And you grew up fast. So, you know, you leave the house, you catch a couple beatings, and then you learn how to give a couple beatings. You know, but those days were the best times. You know, I'm a 69 baby, so you know, those are the times when you can knock on your neighbor's door and you ask them for some extra milk or some sugar. That's when people were people. Today we're living in a fucking crazy world today. Oh, yeah. Nice. I mean, my neighbor was this old Italian woman, Anna Bruno. She sent me baked zita and meatballs. The meatballs had raisins in them. And I took her, I says, Dad, I see, because she goes, she's an old Sicilian woman. That's a, Jimmy. Yeah, that's a, that's a I Sicilian. Said, raisins. That's a Sicilian dish with the raisins yeah. and the meatballs. Oh, my God. I never ate meatballs uh, for like a long time after that. <laughs> you didn't like it? Oh, the raisins, it just it just threw it off, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. my mother used to put breadcrumbs in it, or my, my grandmother used to put, uh, you know, parsley and, and garlic, you know. Why would yeah, I ask you? Me, look, me personally, my aunt, actually makes meatballs with raisins in them and i love them really really i love them i haven't ate them in a while and i miss them but uh oh they're the best they're delicious i love it but you know what listen i love garlic so there has to be garlic in anything i eat whether it's pasta whether it's meatballs meatloaf yeah, yeah. garlic has to be in everything i love garlic i'm the same way jimmy uh calandra did you uh, i'm only saying you know i gotta differentiate between you two did you ever know of of Norman Dupont or of um, uh, before him Jimmy's uncle Mikey Sorelli? Did you ever have any contact with anybody? I, no, I, I didn't. You ever hear any stories? I didn't. Are, the, are these New York City stories? Yeah, Norman Dupont was the caretaker of the Ravenite. Yeah, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not too familiar with uh with that. You know, I'm I'm basically a Brooklyn guy. Yeah. So, you know, I know Joe Butch, you know, I grew up with some of uh, his children. Yeah, I watched uh, his, his girlfriend, Dee Dee, was a good friend with my mom. And, uh, but yeah, as far as the Raven Knight, I was, you know, I was there like maybe five times, hung out with John. <laughs> <laughs> you hung out with A-Light at, uh, at the Raven Knight? <laughs> That's the best, Jimmy. That's, <laughs> uh, that's shit. Well, you know, I, I invented I invented the baseball bat. And that's where yeah. he got the idea to sell them. So he stole that from me. <laughs> he stole the idea of the baseball yeah. bat. From you. I didn't think Babe but, Ruth made all those home runs. <laughs> but listen, even those guys back then, you know, all those guys, they were real men. You know, and you know, looking back, you have nothing but respect for those guys. You know, oh, because yeah. every time you seen them, they had slacks on. They always looked sharp. They had a stack of money in their pocket. And you know what? Some listen. A lot of them were good guys. Some some of them were creeps. You know, and uh, but it was a totally different world back then. You know, I, I wish we could go back to that time. You know, yeah, compared yeah, to exactly. today, those are times yeah. where you could. You know what? You had to leave the house to have fun. You oh know, yeah. Not today. This, the, you know, the fun is gone. You know, this is the fun. Back in the day, everyone had a corner. Now today, everyone has a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the truth. You know, right in the yeah. head. A social media profile. Yeah. <laughs> That's I it. mean, I was telling Chris that I never knew that it was called the Ravenite. I always called it in my sister as as, as Uncle Mikey's. I didn't find out till later on after I moved out and moved back to Long Island with my mother that it was called the Raven Night. Yeah. You know, and all the guys that were in there, you know, they were just my father's friends. You know, yeah. I used to go there, you know, when I was a kid, they used to give me five, ten dollars. I go back to Long Island, which was to go see my grandmother on Sunday. I'd have 30, 35 dollars in my pocket. 
I was I was a king back then, seven eight year old kid. Of course, yeah, so you, you, yeah, you two have that in common then, right? You both had that experience. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is before it got it got renovated. It was this is when it was green and it said members only on the outside and it had a bench. And it had the Doberman Pinchia Dookie that used to watch it. Every social every social club back then had members only on it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, Jimmy, did you know about back then? I know you were in Brooklyn, but did you guys know that Gotti's uh, headquarters was at uh, on Mulberry Street? Did you know yes, about yeah. that? Okay, yeah. so everybody was aware of that. Yes. Without the media and everything, you just knew. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's all interesting stuff to me. I love hearing these stories. Yeah, and again, and when I seen some of these documentaries on A and E and Discovery, this and that, and it was saying, "Oh, first they said my grandmother's name, Nina Sorrell." My uncle and aunt got got upset, and my father too, and they contacted the Daily News. And they said, "You better you better print a retraction, or we're going to sue you." The very next day, the article was like this big, not. Yeah. Lena Sorelli, Nettie Sorelli. And then I started getting phone calls when I was in Long Island from this Jerry Capici. He thought I was my father. I says, oh, who are you? Who are you? I never heard of you before. Oh, I'm Jerry Capici. This and that. Is this Vincent Sorelli? I says, you got the, I said, that's my father. Do I sound like I'm 55 years old? I mean, this is back in uh, in the 90s. Yeah. I says, so I'll, I'll, how'd you get this number? This and that. You know, that was a real creep. Jimmy, you were laughing. I was, making, I was making millions. You were laughing, Jimmy. Do you have some experience with Jerry Capici? I have a feeling you do. Jerry Capici, in all honesty, I really don't have any experience with him. Oh, okay. I might I might have spoke to him once or something. I don't I don't remember. Probably maybe not, but uh I wasn't uh you know too friendly with all these guys. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean you know, I mean, after I after I cooperated, I I never spoke with him ever. He never reached out to me to talk to me. I never felt to reach out to him. You know, the only guy I spoke to was probably uh that guy Ed Scarpo. You know I'm saying, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. the only guy I ever spoke to. I mean, I really didn't. I mean, in all honesty, you know what? This stuff, you know, it really uh, you know, because I was involved in the street, I really had no interest in this stuff. You know, like when I was away, I used to love to read true story books, you know, and uh, but as far as reading the articles, you know, yeah, I would read the articles, but I really never spoke about it, you know, as yeah. far as the mob stuff, because it really wasn't a, it, you know, it wasn't no interest to in me, you know, like I, you know, now I tell my stories and, you know, just things that I knew about, things that I experienced in my life. But uh, you know, some people talk about this where they really like to, you know, talk about the mob stuff, but it really don't interest me, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and um earlier what happened was uh I was talking to Jimmy on the phone, Jimmy Calandra, and uh he knew he asked what I was doing tonight. I said I was having the Sorellis on, and he said, Well, let me know, maybe I'll pop on for a little bit. And I thought that would be perfect because I'm assuming you guys are around are around the same age, right? Yeah, I'm fifty five. He's 55. I'll be 52 in November. Yeah, yeah. So I figured, and I know you were going to have uh, Jimmy on your show, weren't you? Yes, I was going to have him on. One, yeah. Okay. Yeah, That's so, what I understand. You sold fireworks down on Canal Street, right? Back in the day when I was a kid, Alfredo Temperino had a spot. I think it was a Central, Central Street and shoot, yeah. yeah, it was right off a of canal, and mm -hmm. it was it was Joe Butch's spot, and we would be over there in the early '80s, and we would go fireworks, firecrackers, yep. fireworks, five thousand pack, six thousand pack. And this was the time when New York City was great, and you could what you do is you get their order, they tell you what what you want, you go to the spot, you get them their stuff, and uh. You know, you exchange money. It was an easy way to make money. But, you know, back then, it was it was great. I mean, you can't sell fireworks today. Now it's a felony. Oh, forget it. Forget it. It's under the Patriot you know? Act. 
So, but it was such a fun time and the money we made and just hanging out on the corner with a beach chair and just yelling out fireworks, fireworks. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. But, the beach uh, chairs. You know, New York city was the best man. You know, I love New York. I'm born and raised in New York, but the times have changed. And, uh, you know, today you leave your house, you have to go over a toll and then also, you got to watch how you speed because I just paid $132 in pocket and uh, in red tickets. You know, when you drive, you get a ticket. New York City, as soon as you leave the house, you're going for money. You're getting a ticket. You're going over a toll. It, it's insane. I mean, seriously, to live in New York, you have to make tons of money. It's crazy. You know? Yeah. yeah and um, Jimmy Sorelli, uh, you, uh, Jimmy Calandra always tells stories about the fireworks displays that Spiro would put on and stuff like that on Fourth mm -hmm. of July. Did you did you see a lot of that in Little Italy when you were there? Because I know they. Did. Oh yeah. yeah, every block had a display, and barbecue, and it was just uh, it was twenty four hours on July Fourth. We would stop selling fireworks. We would pull the tables out, put all the stuff on tables. The cops left us alone, and it was just one one fun night. One fun night. Every every like if you walked on Hester Street, there was the display. You walked on Grand Street, Broom Street, but the only two blocks, well, Prince and Houston was they didn't have anything there. But those other blocks in between Mulberry and Mott, uh, it was it was unbelievable. It was like it's like the fireworks displays that uh, Mr. Sparrow had in Brooklyn and, and other parts of the city. Yeah, Sparrow, Sparrow gave the best fireworks show, and then some guys would, uh, you know, copy him. But once Frankie De Chico died, Anthony Sparrow stopped putting on the fireworks shows. You know, but Michael DeSantis, he also used to put up the fireworks shows too. But he's from the yeah. he's from Gravesend, but he used to put on a good show too. But there was nothing like Sparrow shows. I'm talking about mortars all over the streets. Dozens of them just dropping them in, going up in the air, and then cases of cases of firecrackers in the middle of the street with gasoline all over it. And then we, <laughs> then we seriously look, and then you just throwing a match, and you see this big woof, a big flame hitting like a six story building to the sixth floor, just and people are just holding their ears because it's insane, you know. But I mean, look, those are the days. And, you know, they're great memories. And then they got a display of food. You want drinks. They got oh, yeah. garbage cans filled with sodas. They got all kinds of food on the tables. I mean, listen, it's a time that's never going to happen again, you know. But those are oh, great yeah. times. They really were. Jimmy, remember the uh, the phone booths in Chinatown? They were like, like dragons, whatever they were. Yes. On the you know how many times I blew those up with blockbusters or uh, pineapples? <laughs> yep. And I used to run down the, the subway on Canal, the number six train, almost every night up to the fourth. At Right before the end of the night, boom. And I would just take off. That's another thing. Back in the day, you had the Blockbuster, you had the M80s. And you know what? You would just light them up and just toss them, you know? I mean, you think about it now. I mean, if you look back, think about doing that today. And you just throwing bombs. It's like you're throwing bombs just in the street. <laughs> and you're throwing bombs, you know, and you hear boom, boom. It's like, in all honesty, you wouldn't be able to sleep, yeah. you know. But I remember, look, after after the Fourth of July, the next morning, I was a kid. Me and my friends, little Georgie Adamo, Polio, for Brits, we would be on the street looking for empty packs, the ones that didn't go off. We would be on the street, you know, what I mean, picking up empty packs and just. You know, and then lighting them off the next day. But that's what we used to do. Yeah. I'd be uh, taking the money out of my sock and taking out the iron and a towel. And because they were so full of sweat, and I'd iron the money. And my father would come home and he's like, What are you doing? I says, I had them in my sock. I said, I don't want to get pinched because they take your money. They take your firework list and they take your money. So I'd either put it under, uh, under my shoe and my sock or up, you know, in my underwear. And when I come home, I'd iron it, get the sweat out of it in the dirt. And he'd start laughing. He goes, that's what my father used to do. I had enough money to last me for the whole summer. $2,300, $3,000. Back then, it was a lot of money. Yeah. 
that's that was the thing with me. Every time I made money, I just kept on spending it. You know, I I really never saved it, and uh, that was the fun part, spending it. Oh yeah, yeah. We go down to the Jersey Shore for a week, race hell. Yeah. Great, uh, even back rec, 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 rec hotel doors, seaside heights, Bradley yeah. Beach. Even back in the day, even even the gambling. I mean, listen, used to gamble, used to go in the social club if you wanted to make a bet. Now today, you go on the computer. You know, I mean, they give you a piece of paper, you hold on to it. If you won the bet, the next day or later on in the day, you just give it to the guy who you took the bet who who took the bet from you, and you get paid. Now today, you got to go through a computer, you got to use a credit card. Oh, it's man. a totally different world today, you know. But, you know, those times were great times <clears throat> back then. Oh, yeah. I remember one night, the neighborhood number, I had $8 on me, and my cousin had 6 And we put it on the, the number 8. Two hours later, comes over, gives us $80. My cousin looked at me, he says, how much did you have on you? I says, $8. He goes, I had 6 You know something? Let's go to the Spring Street Lounge. This and that. Hung out, made a night of it. Eighty dollars back then it went pretty far, but we never used to leave the neighborhood. Yeah, well, you know what? That that's what it, that's what it was. You know, no one left the neighborhood. Wherever you were from, you were safe there. If you left the neighborhood, you know you were not as safe as in the neighborhood. You know, my friend Paulie G. He never left the neighborhood. He used to love to stay in the neighborhood. Every so often, he would leave the neighborhood. And if you left the neighborhood, we would all probably have pistols on us, you know. But, you know, when you're in your own neighborhood, you're safe. When you go out of the neighborhood, then you know what? There's a red flag. You know, you got to be careful. Because if you go into someone else's neighborhood, listen, you're not a tough guy no more. There's a tough guy in that neighborhood. You know, that's just the way it is, you know. Yeah. I just want to change the conversation a little just to, you know. Every once in a while, we would venture out to Sullivan Street, you know, down in the village. We had friends there. But if we had problems, we had to run up either Prince Street or Spring Street to get back to the neighborhood. This and that. So they would tell us, guys, and they, hey, look, where are you guys going? Stay here. You go, you know, somebody else's neighborhood, you guys get in trouble, we're not helping you. That's it. Even when if I it's Italian to, kids. When I used to go to New York City, Manhattan, my father introduced me to Manhattan. I love Manhattan. Now, coming from Brooklyn, and then walking down Prince Street or Sullivan Street, I thought I was a movie star, you know, as, as a kid, because it's a totally different world in Manhattan compared to Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, you got all the tough guys, everyone's hanging out. In Manhattan, people are just minding their business. They're walking down the street, you know. I mean, you can see a movie star, and they'll just keep on walking, you know. But it's a different world. Movie stars, I mean. Boom Boom Mancini, I got his autograph. Sophia Loren, Joe Piscopo, Dom DeLuise. One, one time in the feast, the day before, he was throwing dough, hit my father in the face. Dom DeLuise. The names my father called them. Yeah, Dom DeLuise, a, a funny guy. Yeah. Good guy. Yeah. Originally from, uh, from Brooklyn. I think so, yeah. yeah. I remember my dad met him once. Uh, he used to show me the movie. What was it, Faxo, I think? Fatso. Yeah, yeah, with Dom Dolores, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, he made he made a funny my earbuds. I tell you, he made a funny movie with Burt Reynolds, Dom Deluise, called The End. They were both in the crazy house. Uh Burt Reynolds is in the crazy house, and Dom Deluise is a patient, and he comes in and he makes believe he's a doctor. And anyway, he's a mental patient in the crazy house. But it's a really funny movie. I mean, even back in the day, even the movies back then were so much better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hold on, Jimmy. Uh, lost Jimmy. Uh, yeah. Wait a minute. All right, let me get him back. All right, I got you. You there? I, you know, I figured it out. Every time I touch my right ear, bud, I, I, I hang up on you. So I got to leave it alone. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jimmy, didn't you meet, uh, didn't, you, didn't you have a Matt Dillon story? Was that in Manhattan? That was in Manhattan, yes. I met Matt Dillon when he was very big. 
and it was a fun time. What happened was I was uh, taking a couple of things out of my father's warehouse. And I was with my cousin, Sal. I was with my brother, John. And all of a sudden, we're walking down Prince Street. And we're, we have some stuff on dollies. And we're hitting the train on Broadway. Yeah. But we run into Sullivan Street. And all of a sudden, my brother goes, holy shit, that's Matt Dillon. And I'm like this. I'm like, you know what? Fuck Matt Dillon. Come on. We get the fuck out of here. Let's go. We got to go home. You know? So my cousin Sal and my brother John starts chasing Matt Dillon. And they stop in the pizzeria on uh, on Sullivan Street. There's a pizza off the corner over there, pizzeria. And as soon as I saw Matt Dillon, I changed my whole tune. I'm like this. Oh, Matt Dillon. I said, you know what? Can I have your autograph? <laughs> but it was funny, you know? It was funny. I, mean, I was going, ah, fuck Matt Dillon. Then as soon as I saw him in person, I was like, oh, Matt Dillon, can I have your autograph? Was, was that around the time of the Outsiders? It was, you know, it was I, after. Yeah, it was after the Outsiders. It was like uh, maybe Drugstore Cowboy and uh, yeah. a couple of She was living on Elizabeth Street. Like Rumble Fish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, Matt Dillon's story, he came one time about a week before the feast and he started doing pull-ups on the Don't, do, do Not Walk sign. And he was tall, very good looking guy. So my friend goes over to him. He goes, do it for Johnny. Yeah. And he looked at him. He says, I says, hey, we used to call the kid Dingsy. I says, Dingsy, this guy's just calling you an asshole. I says, what, what are you saying? He goes, well, you know, this and that. All the girls look at him. He just goes on the roof and takes a dead. I says, so? Is he, he can buy and sell you. <laughs> go and say, do it for Johnny. But, uh, stuff like that. We used to see celebrities all, all the time. They filmed Pope of Greenwich Village uh, in my neighborhood. Great movie. It's a great yeah, movie. That, excellent movie. Yep. Oh, great movie. Matter of fact, the ending scene when Burt Young jumps through the social club. Yeah. I was walked. That was 1984. I was walking home from school. They blocked off the whole area. I said, what's going on? He says, oh, we're filming a movie, this and that. I said, I got to go home. You're going to wait. Yeah. And I went home. I says, Dad, what was going on? He goes, Ah, they were making a movie about Pope of Greenwich Village. I said, But this is not Greenwich Village. You know something? Why don't you keep your mouth shut and stop asking questions? I'll tell you back That's then. My father was. I'll tell you back then, Eric Roberts was just coming up. Now he's a B list actor. Back then, he was an A list actor. Him and uh, Mickey Rock. I used to love Mickey Rock. I still love Mickey Rock, but he's, you know, changed a little. But uh, yeah. yeah, that was a great movie. I love the score, the score guy that did the locks, and then he get then uh, what's his name? Bugs, Burt Young. What's his name? Burt uh, Young. Yeah. What's his name? Uh, in the movie. Ah oh, shit! I don't know. Oh, uh, Holy uh, Bedbug, Bedbug, bed Eddie bug. Grant. There you go, Bedbug, and that's when uh, they cut off. Eric Roberts' finger. He said, they took my thumb. fucking finger, Charlie. They took my fucking finger. They took my thumb, Charlie. Yeah, they took thumb. my thumb. They took my thumb. But yeah, it's a great movie. And then Mickey Rock walks in the social club and he and uh, he tells him, he says, uh, when I leave here, he says, I'm the Pope of Greenwich Village. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when, when I was at my grandmother's on Bay Ridge Parkway and... Uh, there were, we were dropped. Me and my mom left. We were going somewhere, and there was a bunch of stuff going on. And it was they were actually filming. Uh, I think it was Out for Justice. Out for Justice. They filmed, and they filmed that in my in my neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one too. I loved that movie as a kid. Yeah, I was uh, I was in his fan club. That's when I was studying martial arts. Big Steven Seagal fan. I had his poster in my room. I had his card in my wallet. And I, this is when I moved out of the neighborhood. I moved back to Long Island. I started yeah. studying. I was oh, I was big on him, big on him. Yeah, and look He's, now. This movie was the first one above the wall. Yeah, I love when he, ahead, yeah, when he first came out, Steven Seagal, he was really good, you know. And then, uh, you know, then after a while, I guess you get played out. Yeah, he had that whole series of movies, and uh, they were excellent. But it's funny to look at him now, what a different guy he is. Yeah. I'll tell you, 
even the TV shows back then were so much better. You know, I remember the TV show. I'm not. I know. I know. Uh, the fat boss is saying don't remember it, but there was a TV show. Jimmy, you probably remember it. It was called Wise Guy, with Ken oh, Wall. Yeah. Ken Wall, yeah. And he plays he's in. Uh, what was that movie The Wanderers? Uh, the Wanderers, great movie. Oh yeah, it's a great movie. The Wanderers. That's that's funny you said that, but you know, and uh, but that's a movie he should see. The Wanderers with uh, the Dookie Boys. Dude, he would love it. Uh, it's a, it's I don't think great, I saw that. It's a, I it's love a it, Chris. movie about all the gangs, the Italian gangs, the Wanderers, the Chinese, the blacks, and you know what? It was really. I'm telling you, it's a funny and it's a good movie. You got to see it. The Baldies. Yeah. And it's pretty yeah. accurate because my wife is from that neighborhood, Arthur Avenue. Yeah. And she never seen that movie. Maybe seven, eight years ago, I, I, I put it on. She's like, where'd you get this? I says, Ann, you never seen this movie? She goes, oh, my God, that's Fordham Road. That's where uh, Alexander's used to be, this and that. She says, oh, my God, that's how Allerton Avenue used to look. I says, and you never seen this movie? And you grew up around there? She says, never seen that movie. She fell in love with it. You talk about movies. I'll give you another another great movie. Because you're my age. So uh, you got a couple of years on me. How about Fort Apache, the Bronx? Oh, my God. With Paul Dana Yellow and Paul Newman. Another great movie. That was my dad's favorite. Yeah, he that's another great movie. movie. Yeah. The funny thing is, I do DoorDash part time. I'm always in that neighborhood. Okay. I'm probably the only white guy. I go in all those buildings and deliver food. And I really? look around and I'm like, it it actually is Fort Fort Apache. Yeah. It hasn't changed much. Yeah, Parts what? of it, yeah. It's getting better. But it, back then it was, you know, and I wasn't even living in the Bronx back then. Yeah, that was based on a true story. Oh yeah. Fort Apache, the Bronx. Yeah. That's when the Bronx was burning. Yeah, people are bringing up movies here now. Mean Streets. Mean Streets. Oh, my great God. Movie. The Bible of the of Mulberry Street. Great movie. Mean Streets. My uncle is in that movie, the part where he's throwing shots on the roof, Robert De Niro. Yeah. And, and they're sitting in the door, and they say, hey, what, is, what does he have on him? That was my father's brother, Bobby. He's got the pea cap on. So that they, they didn't give him anything. They just they were going to pay him or keep him in the movie. So they decided to well, stay in the movie. So it was 10 minutes of fame. Another, uh, another great. See, go ahead. You see this question, U.S. Army Combat Medic. FBS, can you ask Jimmy C. if Seth Lowe Jr. is still there? What's Jimmy C. Talking, talking about? I'm He's, not sure. What is he talking about? Is he, is he talking about a school? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure to be honest. What do you guys think, though? What do you guys think is the best uh, from both of your opinions? Because I don't know if you ever talked about this, Jimmy. What do each of you think is the best gangster movie? The best gangster movie? I did it again. Uh, FBS, Savelli, Jimmy C. There's a, look, there's a couple. Of them. I don't know what he's talking about. So I would say. First of all, The Godfather is a great movie. Oh, yeah. Okay. The Godfather is a great movie, part one or two. I mean, Francis Ford Coppola is awesome. I love him. Uh, I would love to work with him. He's great. Uh, there's another movie that's called Gangster Wars. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it. No. It's, not, it's an old-time film. I liked it. But for me... I would say The Godfather, and also, I loved Once Upon a Time in America. I mean, it took, oh, yeah. them, it took them 10 years to make that film, Once Upon Is a Time really? in America. It took them 10 years. But, uh, wow. yeah, I, I love Once Upon a Time in America because it shows a story about these young kids coming up, uh, you know, and they had their own little crew, and they're surrounded by these guys. And eventually, you know, one of the guys in their crew burns them, you know, over some money. 
But it's a great story. It really is. And it's a film that uh, I really love. And I love Robert De Niro in it because Robert De Niro, he plays noodles. And in, and in the scene, in one of the scenes when they tell James Woods, Noodles tells James Woods, his character, he goes, today they tell me and you to kill Joe. Tomorrow they tell me to kill you. Is that okay with you? Because that's not okay with me. But it tells you the story of how the mob works. You know, today, me and the fat boss are saying we're going to go kill this guy, Jimmy. Now, tomorrow, they're going to tell me to kill you. Is that okay with you? Because that's not okay with me. You know, but just the dialogue uh, in the film is great. I love uh, Tuesday Wells. I love that they do a lot of scores in the movie, you know. I'll change, I'll change the subject to another movie. Another great movie I love is James Caan, Thief. You know, if you ever seen that movie, that's a great yeah. movie. You know, what he does is uh, he walks into the club, he shows a pistol, and he tells the, the bouncer, he says, beat it, Flash, mean, meaning he's flashing the gun, you know. But uh, that's another great movie, you know, Thief. I tell you, I tell uh, I told this to Chris a couple weeks ago. Robert De Niro... Uh, is a family friend of on my father's uh, side of the family. He grew up on Elizabeth Street, and he was always saying that he was going to become a movie star. It's not used to wear hats. Guys in the neighborhood used to pick on him. Then he made Bang the Drum slowly, about to catch. Uh, I think he played for the Yankees. I had that disease, and he and he passed away. Then he made Mean Streets, and then he made Taxi Driver after that. And you know, he rose to the to stardom. But one time. I was with my father eating in my friend's restaurant. I told this to Chris. A guy came in with a handkerchief covering from his nose down. I says, Dad, who's that? It was a beautiful black girl in the other part of the restaurant. I says, who's that? He goes, that's Robert De Niro. I said, get out of here. It's Robert. He goes, Jimmy, that's Robert De Niro. He says, leave him alone. So the waiter, who was a friend of ours, come over. He says, Junior. He says, uh, can, I, can I get his autograph? He says, well, he doesn't like to be bothered when he's eating. When he's done, I'll go over to him and I'll ask him. He says, you know him? He goes, I, we grew up with him. The, the girl, the woman was gorgeous. I think it was Grace Hightower. It was, I don't know if he's still married to her. Yeah. You. Yeah. You. Robert De Niro is a great actor. 100%. Uh, Al Pacino. I love Al Pacino. Uh, Marlon Brando. Now, if we go back to the old time, it's James Cagney. This guy just said Angels with 30 Faces. Rocky Sullivan, he played. I mean, but the old time is a guy like James Cagney. This guy was a triple threat. He could sing, he could dance, and he could act. I mean, you ain't going to never see people like this again, ever. I mean, these guys were one of a kind. I mean, and they all laughed at each other. When they stopped laughing at you, they knew they didn't like you. knew they didn't like you anymore. You know, so you had to have a sense of humor back then. You know, today, everybody's so serious. You got to lighten up a little, you know. Yeah. And, and I tell you, every time I want to watch Angels with Dirty Faces, I can't find it. Or I see 10 minutes of it, and you go to another YouTube channel, another I say, hey, come on. I want to watch it from start to finish. I don't want to watch little bits and pieces of it. That's one of the greatest movies i ever seen. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, yeah, it's a great, great film. And, uh... I like the part when he goes, uh, when Rocky Sullivan gives the dead end kids, he gives him a fin, gives him a five dollar bill. He said, here's a fin, go down to the deli. He says, and get some hot dogs and some buns. He says, you know, and then come back. So they spent five cents and they robbed everything else. And he said, he said, uh, he said, he said, Rocky, we spent five cents. And, uh, you know, we had to spend something. But meanwhile, they stole everything, you know. But uh, listen, movies like that, you're never going to see them again. You know, even Edward G. Robinson. I mean, these guys were the best, man. They really were. Well, my, my father said, even though he was Jewish, he played Italian better than Italians, Edward G. Robinson. Yeah. It was, I, and I, I, didn't, I could not see him in Ten Commandments. Great movie. I just didn't think he should have been in that movie. Because of the roles that he played in the past. Because every time I see that movie, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I can't see him as whoever the party played the Ten Commandments, uh, the Roman Emperor, whatever he was. Yeah. Because I see him as somebody different. 
Well, a great movie. Yeah, th those guys, you know, they got into character and they played a good part. You know, I mean, today, some guys don't even have to act. They just, you know, they go on and they do their thing. You know, it's a uh, different type of people today. But Robert De Niro is definitely a great actor, 100%. That, uh, Jimmy, that, uh, that makes me think because, you know, like I said, my, uh, my, my aunt and uncle and my cousins lived on 16th Avenue and 86th. And uh, they used to see Tony Sirico all the time in the Vegas diner. What do you think about him? Because what you just said makes me think about that. I mean, this is a guy who's not even acting. That's Tony Sirico. That's who he really is. Well, you know what? Look, some guys like Tony Sirico, I don't know him. I know he's from my neighborhood. I might have passed him up a couple times. But, uh, I mean, guys like that, he don't have to act. I'm sure he does a little acting, you know, and everything he does on The Sopranos, he's great. You know, I mean, The Sopranos is a great series. And, uh, you know, I wish I could have been a part of it. You know, I mean, you know, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. But uh, those guys, you know, and plus he did time, too. This yeah, guy, yeah. Uh, Tony Sirico. I think he did like five, six years. In Attica, so, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, and he uh, hung out with some tough guys. Uh, exactly. And, and you know what? He's a tough guy. So, so. Oh, yeah. You see these guys, and you might not think that they're tough guy because they're actors, but these guys are tough guys too. You know, I mean, they act like gentlemen, but if you push them, they'll show you they bite too. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Can well, I ask you one? Too tight, they went back down. No, Jimmy. Can I ask you one thing? Since we got Jimmy Sorelli on here, and a lot of uh, you know, his story kind of is based around. John Gotti and the Ravenite. Could you tell us real quick about your uh, your first meeting with uh, John Gotti? The first time I met John Gotti? Yeah. Yeah, well, the first time you met him. Maybe I worded that wrong. <laughs> yeah. The first time I met John Gotti, I was with Georgie DeChico, Bobby DeChico. I was actually with the kid Michael Hampster, too. Okay? This was after they took over the family. And we went down to Pastel's. We were sitting in one of the booths. All of a sudden, John Gotti walks in. He sits down. And we walk over with Giorgio DeChico. We get to shake his hand. Now, I was maybe, at that time, 1986. I would say the beginning of 1986, January, February. This was before Frank DeChico got killed. Uh, about 15 years old, you know. So, but just to walk up to him and say, you know, hi, John, you know, and, but, th but this is a guy when I was a kid, look, I used to love John Gotti. You're saying, I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a moment where I went home that night and I told my mother, I said, Ma, you never know who I met today. I said, I met John Gotti. She was like, you really met John Gotti? I said, yeah, Ma, I met John Gotti, you know, and, uh, you know, when I was growing up, being around these guys, your family actually wanted that because they know you were safe, you know? So in a way, as much as my mother loved Jesus and, you know, she was into this God and she would always preach the word to me, she, you know, she was, in a way, she was happy that I was around the wise guys, but... She also knew the streets where, you know, it could get ugly too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, I remember my first, uh, my first, I guess, encounter with any of these guys. We were at a diner in Howard Beach because my great grandmother lived there. Me, my, uh, my father and my mother. And, you know, we were sitting there having dinner and, you know, there was a divider between the tables. And there was the guys on the other side and they were cursing, you know, saying a lot of crude stuff. And my dad, of course, jumped up and said, you know, you want to watch your mouth in front of my fucking wife and kid? And I don't know who these two guys were, but apparently as soon as they stood up, my dad did. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I remember, um, you know, my dad, he took a step back as he, he understood, you know, right away who he was dealing with. And they said something to him 
uh, more or less like, you know, we don't have to take this any further. You know, you made a mistake. You know what I mean? And nothing came out of it. But um, my dad also was, uh, you know, his, his grandfather was connected or his father was connected to Fritzy. And my dad knew Fritzy. So he, you know, he knew he had his back. But but still, uh, I remember those days and certain run-ins I had when we lived in New York. Now, is Fritzy the one who got murdered? No, nah, Fritzy Giovanelli. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was under the chin. He was a captain. He died in 2017, I think. Okay, yeah, because there's another Fritzy in my neighborhood. That was a wild man. They murdered him later on. Oh, really? I didn't even know yeah. there was another one. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, those are, those are uh, times where uh, there were special moments, you know? Yeah. Well, my my dad raised me on all this shit, man. So that's all I did. He, he, it's wrong to uh, put it this way. I wouldn't I wouldn't do what the, what my father did with me. You know, he drove me around. He would, he would drive me past the the Bergen, shit like that. When I, I'm talking about little, little, you know what I mean? When I was very, very young, and he would you know point people out to me when we were in Bensonhurst. You know, he would always and he kind of raised me in all this stuff. That's why I always took an interest in mob stuff because that's all he told me about. He would tell me who the guys were. He would drive me past social clubs and point them out to me in Queens and Brooklyn. So, you know, growing up now and hearing these stories from you, Jimmy, and, and also you with the Ravenite, uh, this is a trip to me. You know, you know and, the, and the thing is, back in those days, it was very easy to get killed. You know, yeah. I mean, if you got out of order, you did, you know, you stepped on someone's toes. If someone, if you looked at someone the wrong way, you were, you know, pretty much going to get killed, you know, whether they were going to sneak you or whether they were friendly with you and take you out to dinner before they kill you, you know? So, you know, those times were a lot different and uh, it was always good to know somebody and have a good name, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah I, I was always told, you know, keep your mouth shut, mind your business. If somebody answers you something, say you don't know. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably your best bet. Um, uh, what did I want to ask Jimmy Sorelli? Um, shit, it slipped my mind now. Um, yeah, I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> I don't know. Alzheimer's comes in at my age. How know. many uh, people in the chat room? We got 239 people in here right now. Okay. Yeah, this is going well. Everybody's happy. Every uh, if, you, if you guys want to take a couple of questions real quick, if anybody sure, has let's take them. Sure. All right, yeah. Questions for Jimmy Sorelli or Jimmy Calandra. Uh, let me know, guys. I'll pull them up on the screen now. If they ask me if that's my real hair so far. <laughs> How is it that you guys – see, my dad – my dad's in his 70s. I haven't seen him in years. I, I saw him uh, maybe 2012 was the last time. He's still got a full head of hair. Full head of hair. My brother, he's 49 years old. Full head of hair. And I got this shit. Wow. How did that happen to me, guys? Oh, it wow. looks good. You, It's perfect uh, on you, Chris. Yeah, but I want if my I hair. Was, if I was bald, they yeah, probably call you. me the junior. I got to send Queen. you a Beth Avenue hat. Yes, you do. Please, Jimmy. I have I to send you one. Cover that reminds me, uh, Jimmy. Yeah, I got to get a shirt and a hat. They're right yeah, on. I, I, I got to send, send you one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Styling and profiling said Jimmy C. Best pizza place in the Bronx. Louis and Ernie's. Louis and Ernie's. What? Uh, Waterbury uh, Avenue. What about Brooklyn, Jimmy? They're all over the place. I, you know, I like to go to. There's a place on 65th Street and 20th Avenue. Every so often, you'll catch me in there. It's uh called Europa Pizza. They're really good. They have good uh, pizza in there. They have good dishes in there. Then you got an 18th Avenue and uh, 64th Street. There's a pizzeria off the corner, Da Vinci. Uh, you know, th listen, there's pizzerias all over Brooklyn where they're good. You what know, about uh, Spumoni Gardens? Spumoni Gardens, you know what? Listen, I like Spumoni Gardens, but it's a little overrated. I think you have new owners over there. Uh, it's, really? not, it's not what it used to be. Listen, I love Spumoni Gardens. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I buy... When I go there, I don't buy one pie. I buy two pies. I buy the pie that we're going to eat at the table, and then there's another pie that goes in the refrigerator. 
The next morning, oh. I'll grab a slice and I'll eat the pizza in the morning. You know, I mean, I'll eat it cold. <laughs> Seriously, I'll eat the pizza cold. Yeah, yeah uh, me too. Back, back uh, then. Anyway. Yeah. But uh, Spumoni Gardens is good. I mean, you know, it's, it's a nice atmosphere. You also have an ice cream parlor over there. You can get some ice cream dessert. But uh, it's been there for a long time, you know, like 50 years, Spumoni Gardens. Yeah, Jimmy, did you go to, uh, because when I when I was at my aunt and uncle's house, anytime, even once we moved here and we would go back and visit, we always went to Mona Lisa Bakery. Mona Lisa? Court Street, I believe, right? Oh, yeah, I remember Mona Lisa, of course. Yeah, yeah, that was right across from the, uh, well, it was right right by Vegas Diner on the other side of the of street. Yeah, I remember Mona I'll Lisa. Think, I'll take it to yeah, yeah, now they closed it, I guess. We were just there. We were in Bensonhurst maybe a year ago. They closed it, and they put a little one on, uh, I don't even know if it was 77th, maybe? It, yeah, it, and look, look, in Brooklyn, you have a lot of good bakeries. You have a nice bakery on Kings Highway, very clean, and uh, West 6th Street. Uh, then you have another bakery, Labat, uh, Labate, on 18th Avenue. Then you have another one on Bay 50th Street. But this bakery is all over in uh, New York. I know. You know? I mean, and there's still a bakery on Bay Parkway in uh, 70 something Street, Ramini Bakery. It's been there for maybe 40 years. But uh, look, look, one thing about New York, in all honesty, it's very expensive here, but the food, you ain't going to get nothing like it nowhere else. You know, New York City food is the best. I don't care what anybody says. We used to go to the place, do you remember this, Jimmy, on 86th called the Pizza Plate? It was in like that little strip with the grocery store. Uh, I, can't remember, I can't remember what grocery store it was, but we went back there. I took Shannon back there, and it's not that. It's like a it's like a chain type of place now, almost like a corporate type of place. It wasn't the same. Where was it located? It was located on eighty sixth and and sixteenth, uh, like like. Uh, there's yeah. a little strip mall there. There's a grocery yeah. store. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know yeah. what you're talking about. And then across the street is uh like uh, a Dwayne Reed or something. Yeah. 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 I, they, yeah. What they what they did was they knocked all that stuff down and they rebuilt that. So you know the neighborhood has changed a lot, but they have uh but they have a nice pizzeria over there. I forgot the name of it. It's like a franchise pizzeria. Yeah, maybe that's where we went. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. good food. But it wasn't like, you know, a New York pizzeria that, you know what I mean? Like it was more, it was fancy kind of. Yeah. And then you have the, you have the spot on, uh, what is it? Avenue J and East 16th street. The, uh, the guy's been there for maybe 40, 50 years. I forgot the name of the place, but they got good pizza, but every so often they're closed down. You know, you got to catch them when they're open. Then you got uh, another place in Coney Island, Totona's. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Another a uh, good spot. They're open like maybe four days a week, you know. But uh, listen, there's a lot of big money in pizza. You make a lot of money in pizza, especially if you make a good pizza, you know. Now, this guy from Boston just did Luigi's in uh, downtown Brooklyn. He, he rated it a 9.3. Now, since then, every day, there's been lines around the corner. Guy has power, man. He has power. This, this guy, Boston, what's his name? David Portnoy. There you go. Well, he gave them a 9.3. Look, ever since then, about 10 days now, there's been lines around the corner. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, do you remember Hotline Pizza, Jimmy, under the, the L on 86th? And You know what? I don't remember that one, but Lenny's Pizzeria was still underneath the L. It's yeah, still yeah. There. it's still there. It's still there. 20th Avenue and 86th Street. It's still there. Yeah, we were just there like a year ago. Yeah, I said yeah, I had to, two, I two, had two, to show two, Shanna two, around. Two. She didn't know anything about New York. I had to show her around Brooklyn. Uh, so I got some questions here for uh, probably for both of you. Let's see. What's this? The bike guy. Yeah, biker guy in Lewisburg that looked like Satan, Charles Manson. The biker guy in Lewisburg. I don't know. There's a couple of them. Uh, let's see what else we got. Do you ever vis visit Boston, Mass, Jimmy? Yes. You know what? Listen, I love Boston. I really do. I was in Boston a couple times. It's a great city. And uh, 
all the guys out there are tough guys. All these Irish and guys, they're all, listen, every Irish guy I knew in Boston, they're all tough guys. Even in prison, I met, they're all tough. They're, they're all crazy fucking nut jobs. Yeah. Um, let's see. Dana Smith says, can we have a hat? <laughs> sure. BK Sal Crook says, Jimmy, you missed the Taking Back 86th Street Cruise outside Lenny's Pizzeria Saturday with Joey Zane. When was that? What, the Saturday just passed? I guess so. Hmm. Well, you know what? My sister and my aunts were there, I think maybe two months ago, and the guy Curtis Lee was walking down 86th Street in that Lenny's Pizzeria, and they got in a photo with him. But 86th Street, back in the day, I don't know if you remember Fat Ball Sicilian, but 86th Street was the best. You cruise down 86th Street, you got all the loud music going on. You mm -hmm. have a, a, a row of people, thousands and thousands of people just hanging out. You had the big hair. But those were the days. And, uh, you know, like I said, back in the day, you know, it was uh, easy to get killed. You know, yeah. even hanging Everybody's out. Driving in Riviera's. Yeah, so you got to be careful, you know. I mean, you always had some knuckleheads going around, and you know, look, we didn't come, we didn't become the Bad Day Avenue crew just by growing up in the neighborhood. We became the Bad Day Avenue crew because of the experiences we've been through. You know, I mean, listen, when we were kids, we were kind of bullied too, you know. And then what you do is eventually you stand up to the bullies, you know. And then you know, it's if you ha if you fought one of us, you had to fight all of us. You know, so but I'm just changing the subject a little. But uh, back in those days, they were the best. Yeah. See, I, I remember I was a little kid, but I always knew, you know, that's where my mom always took me. Uh, 86th Street was where all the excitement was, no matter what. And that's where we went for everything. Like even when we moved to Pennsylvania, when I would do clothes shopping for school in the beginning of the year, we'd go to 86th Street. We'd take a day trip to Brooklyn. You know what I mean? And go to 86th. 86th Street was where everything was at. Um, I remember, like I said, I used to go to the music stop when I started DJing. I don't know if you remember the music stop, Jimmy, but I used to get all my records. Of my course, speakers. of course, the music stop. Of course, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. I still got bags from there with the address and everything. That's where I got all my DJ equipment. And on Avenue X, this is in the hood, but upstairs records. Uh, I would go there to get turntables, shit like that. Uh, let's see. What, Jimmy, back in the day, did you go to Plaza Suite? Plaza Suite, that's on 18th Avenue and 86th Street. All the way down by Cusimano uh, and Russo Funeral Home. That's uh, That is located on West 6th Street and Avenue S. The Plaza Suite you're talking about, that's on 86th Street. And I know what you're talking about. That's Sammy's old place. I yeah. went there, mm -hmm. you know, I went there a couple times. I used to go to my friend Willie and Gerard. And uh, you know what? That was Sammy's place. And the thing is, when I used to go in there, look, if I walked in a wise guy place, any place I walked into, I always knew who, who owned it. So I was very careful of, you know, when I walked in. And if there was too many people, in all honesty, I used to walk out. I wouldn't stay too yeah. long, you know, because that was on the other side of my neighborhood. So if mm -hmm. I'm out of my territory, I'm very careful of, you know, what could happen, you know. So, but yeah, Plaza Suite, I was there a couple of times. Yes. Now it's actually a school. It's a yeah. private school now, yes. Yeah, Jimmy, you posted a picture the other day of, uh, I think it was Mikey Scar's wedding out at Oriental Manor. Yes. I used to drive past that place with my, with my parents as a kid. And they always used to tell me it was a very expensive place. I would see the weddings outside and stuff. Like it was a, like it was a fancy, you know, they always talked about it like it was a very... Uh, upscale type of place to uh mm -hmm. to have a wedding or something like that yeah bad whistles on the bay yeah so when you when you put that picture up jimmy that actually brought back a lot of memories that's not there anymore is it the or no it's not there no more i'm always in the neighborhood uh and across the street was the lowey's movie theater now when we were kids we used to sneak into the lowey's movie theater there was a side entrance you would walk upstairs and one of us would get in and then we would open up the door for all of us, you know. And back and back in the day when we were kids, we used to smoke pot. You know what I'm saying so we used to just smoke pot, roll it up and smoke it right in the movie theater. 
you know, right. until the movie came on. But uh, yeah, the Oriental Man is not there no more. The whole neighborhood changed. You know, it's a, it's a actually that street right there, Bay 19th Street. My ex girlfriend from back in the day, my childhood sweetheart, uh, she actually lived on that block. You know, and I was going out with her for maybe almost twenty years. You know. Yeah. Jimmy, did you ever go to Court Street to Marco Polo uh, restaurant? Course, absolutely, Marco Polo. That's another. That's another wise guy joint. Can you hear me? That's a Gambino. That's a Gambino spot. Marco yeah, it's still Polo. there. I used to go, yeah, I used to go there all the time. You know, and uh, they got some good food in there too. And uh, yeah, I went there a few times. Of course, absolutely. Somebody else. The, uh, the F train there. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Say it ah. again. Say it again, Jimmy. Say it again. I should take the F train to Court Street. Yes. But uh yes, I uh the last time I was in Marco Polo was a couple years ago. The last time I went there was with my friend Jimmy. He ended up passing away of cancer. He was like maybe 47 years old. But uh that's oh, the yeah. last yeah, that's the last time I was there. Here's a good one, Jimmy Calandra. Uh, uh FPS asked Jimmy C what his favorite movie him and Paulie G used to watch together. Well. I used to watch movies every night with Paulie G. What we used to watch was we used to watch some old boxing matches with like Willie Pep. And, uh, you know, Willie Pep used to make believe he used to get hit and he would go down and then he would come back. And, you know, but the boxing matches we used to love to watch. And we used to watch some old flicks, some old movies, uh, like, I don't know, Mean Streets. And uh, all kinds of crime movies, things like that. Did yeah. you ever watch Somebody Up There Likes Me with Paul Newman? Of course, absolutely. That's a uh, uh, great, great movie. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's uh, is that the Graziano story? Graziano. Graziano. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, Paul Newman, listen, Paul Newman is one of my favorites. I love Paul Newman, I love Charlie Bronson. The old timers were the best. You know, nobody could compare to them. And uh, I love watching them. They just had a certain style to them. Mm -hmm. They had class. They had spunk. They were tough. You know, and uh, you're never going to see people like that again. No, nah, no. Nah. I love that movie, The Mechanic. Oh, great movie. The Great Escape. You know, I love I love him, McQueen. I love the old Western movies. Magnificent Seven. I love all the. That's all how the, I was too, Jimmy. All the Western movies, I love them, all of them. You know, Henry Fonda, uh, John Wayne, uh, Bronson, Yo Brenner. I mean, you know, these guys are the best. Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood. I love Clint Eastwood. Yeah, dude, doesn't it seem like? Because uh, I was into them as a kid. I loved uh, westerns. Didn't doesn't it seem like gangster movies kind of took that over and became the new westerns? That's well, what it know, seems like to me. You, you know what it is, but like before the gangsters, there was the cowboys, you know, and the yeah. and the cowboys were the gangsters, you know. Yeah. So, you know, whether you were a good cowboy or you were a bad cowboy, you know, but they were the gangsters. You know what I'm saying it's the same thing, like uh, you know, the five families. You know, look. If you, yeah. they're all cowboys. You know what? Look, some of them are good cowboys. Some of them are bad cowboys. You know, but every everybody wants to be a cowboy. Just that you know, not everybody can be a cowboy. Yeah, I, I love the uh, Young Guns. Uh, young Guns, yeah, was great. That was, that was good. Mm -hmm. Actually, Young Guns and Young Guns too. Those movies were fantastic. Yeah, uh, Gun, Gunsmoke the Don wants to know: Did Paulie G ever see Goodfellas? Uh, I think he did see Goodfellas. What year did it come out? I want to say 91. 91. Yeah, he's, yeah, 91. Yeah, he, yeah, he's seen Goodfellas, yeah, yes. Absolutely. It, was that for, for you kids? It, the age you were, you guys, your crew, was that like the. Uh, did that movie hype you guys up? <laughs> Yeah, it definitely hyped us up. Of course, absolutely. You know, you know, another movie we had to go out of the neighborhood to see was Reservoir Dogs. 
we actually all drove to Manhattan to go see that film. And, I never uh, seen that movie. Never yeah, seen it. it's, a, it's a great, uh, it's a Quentin Tarantino film, and uh, a lot of bank robbery, a lot of violence. They wouldn't play that movie in Brooklyn, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's another film that uh, I like. Quentin Tarantino, the guy's awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah, he makes uh, masterpieces. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's gonna make one more one more film. He said he's gonna make, and then he's done. I think he said after thirteen, he's done. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. yeah. I don't know why he's a uh, the the fucking money he must make oh, off of dude. even one you know, movie. You know, you know what it is, but with these guys, it's not about the money. It's about the artwork that you're putting into it. You know how. You create this film, the dialogue and the characters. It's a, uh, I mean, that's what it is for them. <laughs> you know, they don't even care about the money. Of course, the money helps. Money is fuel. It gets you from here to there. But when you're in that business, it's all about making a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, no name needed. This is for you, Jimmy Clander. What does it say? What uh, what is the word with Shia LaBeouf doing your movie? Is that how you pronounce his name? Shia, Shia, me and Shia LaBeouf right now, we are on the rocks. So we'll see what happens with Shia LaBeouf. You know, he's a, uh, you know, Shia is all right. We'll see what happens with him. Yeah, yeah. And Jimmy Sorelli, I wanted to ask you, you after you moved, you lived in, on Mulberry Street as a kid, but then what did you move to? After Long Island, as an adult, you moved to the Bronx, right? Yeah, I got married. My wife, being from the Bronx, I got stuck. <laughs> you got stuck. <laughs> you got stuck in the Bronx? <laughs> and now I'm here, what, what, over 25 years I'm married, but yeah, get used to it. Oh, you yeah. are married? I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah, I can see the gray hair on top. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing glasses. This guy wants to know about uh, Jimmy's graffiti. Uh, he hears you were good at it. Has you have you done any lately? And and Jimmy Sorelli, were you ever into the graffiti? A little bit. My yeah. brother's a big time artist. Yeah. Yeah, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, back in the day, I used to love to write graffiti. I would bomb the garbage yards, the train stations, everything. I used to have a marker on me at nighttime. I go oh spray. God. I get a. I get a spray can, pan, uh, can, and just bomb everything. Everything would pack. And I put B A B Bed Avenue boys, and I would throw up my friends. And the next morning, when the garbage trucks would drive down the avenue, they would be B A B I D pack can zap zip, and uh, you know that that's what we used to do. I mean, you know that was fun. I got in a lot of trouble. For taking a marker and putting my last name on this donut shop on Mott Street. <laughs> the next day, my father's brother was told by my by Mike D, my father's uncle, blocked that out. My father calls me and says, Uncle Mikey wants to see you. I went, that was maybe in the neighborhood, maybe six months. He says, You never put our name on anything. I says, What? He says, You also wear a shirt that says Sorelli 44. Because I was a big Reggie Jackson fan. He says, you can't wear it no more. I says, what the hell? My father's like, and my father's standing behind him. He says, this is not Long Island. Okay, this is the neighborhood. You don't write your name on buildings. Is that right? Well, that was I a good thing. But what, what the thing is, see, that was the thing about graffiti, is that you never write your name. You write a tag. You're, you're, you're undercover with a tag name, you know? So nobody really knows it's you. Only the people close to you know who's writing it. But you never oh, put your yeah. real name up. You put your real name up, of course, he's going to correct you, you know? Oh, I didn't hear it for years after that. Yeah, we used to you take my uncle out drinking. He used to get, hey, you know, Mike D told you not to write your name. And then, hey, shut up. Well, what, oh. you, <laughs> well, what you did was you actually told on yourself by writing your name. They knew, yeah. it, they knew it was you. I couldn't deny that's, that's why you gotta have a tag. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Um, just I'll take like two or three more questions. And I'll let you guys go because you both gave me a lot of time. I appreciate both of you. The Thank Jared you. Tano, well, the Jared Tano's, the guy has a question over here that I'm looking at. Uh, Benny Jared Tano. Yes, I do know Benny Jared Tano. Uh, he's from downtown Brooklyn. He was actually there when I shot the kid Leo. And uh, but he's a he's a stand up kid. He's doing some time. He's a maniac, and uh, so yeah, I do know the Gerritanos. All right, let me see a couple more. Let's see. Uh, I saw another good one. Oh, I keep. I gotta say this for. I don't know if he wants a shout out, but I know it's for you, Jimmy Calandra, John the Greek. I think he's saying salute from London. Salute, baby. Yeah, I think he's a fan of yours. Um, he knows worldwide, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, BK Shallow Finest wants to know if you knew Caves. The kid Caves. Is that uh, Joey Caves? See, Joey Zane talked about, well, Joseph D'Onofrio. You call him Joey Zane. He, he, asked, he asked me about Caves, but he was talking about music. I thought he was talking about the guy from, uh, isn't, isn't there a guy from... 20th Avenue called Caves? Yes. Now, these kids from 20th Avenue, look, we knew each other, but we really, you know, they knew me. I knew them, but uh, I didn't know them like that, like I knew my friends. You know what I mean? Look, when you're in the neighborhood and you're growing up, it's basically when you know certain people, you want to stay away from certain people. You don't want to get too close because if you get too close, it's either they're going to kill you or you're going to kill them. So you do certain people just stay far away from them, you know, because, uh, you know, if you get too close, eventually something's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's understandable. All right. I think that's uh, that's it for all the questions. Oh, well, one more. Let's see. Is there anyone from your past you wouldn't want to see, Jim? Uh, not really, I tell you. You know, I, I honestly, I don't care who I see. I tell you the truth, because I'm, you know, I'm at a different place in my life. And uh, as far as caring for anybody that I don't, that I don't like, and I don't care for, I really don't give a fuck about them. You yeah. know, so you know, I don't care if I see them or I don't see them. You know, if you see me, you can say hello. If you don't want to say hello, that's your choice. I respect it. But, uh, you know, I'm at a different place in my life, you know. I'm at, the, I'm at a point in my life where I've been through too much bullshit, where mm. if you're a bad person, you, you probably don't want to see me, you know. So. Understood. One more question for Jimmy Sorelli. Did you go to Marina Del Rey? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A couple of uh, engagement parties, uh, two weddings. They're going to make condominiums out of it uh, pretty soon, I hope. Okay. Nice place. All right. Uh, I guess we'll end it. I want to thank both of you guys. Uh, Jimmy Sorelli, of course, I'll have you back on. And I know you gave me something else we didn't get to play tonight. But I honestly was enjoying seeing you and Jimmy have a conversation. Uh, that was cool for me. I, I, I was I was glad he jumped on. I, 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 I got to drive to Brooklyn. We got to hook up. Anytime Take you come down. Pizza place. Yeah, hey, come down. We'll go for some pizza. Mine, not in the Bronx, but downtown on Mulberry Street. Anytime. Tell your, tell your sister I said hi. It was nice talking yeah. to you. Fat Ball Sicilian, I'll see you soon. And just take care of yourself. And don't get down. And don't give anybody any life. I got you. I'm, I'm going to take your advice this time. Trust me. Yeah, we got, Thank we you got for your coming. back, uh, Chris. No, Thank you, I have Jim. to come out of retirement. Ain't nobody going to like the old Jimmy uh, C. And if you got to worry <laughs> about these people, you have no worries. That's the way I see it. Absolutely. What, 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 what do we do back in the day, Jimmy? To them. You know what I'm saying? Just eh. stay away. That's it. You just They're not away. with us. Eh. That's it. That's all. Yeah. And thank you, Jimmy Calandra, because you uh, you actually made the um, the offer to come on and talk to us tonight. I appreciate you giving us your time. It was great. I had a great time. I gotta get a shirt. I gotta get a hat. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta get a mask. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. You guys still need them, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, yeah, we still got to use the mask. Oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, look, even if you get the vaccine, yes, you yes, use the mask. So, <laughs> well, see, Shanna's good about it. She still wears it all the time. I don't, but I should. I can't stand wearing it. I know. I hate it. It sucks. See, my problem is it 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 uh it affects my breathing a lot because I you know I already have the well that's what I do when I put it on I put it over my mouth and I keep it underneath my nose yeah yeah like a breathe you know but when I'm on the job and you're going to these buildings in Manhattan you got to have a mask you know and pretty soon they're going to be asking you for the vaccine you know for the vaccine card you know so yeah yeah it's coming all right guys thank you both I appreciate it uh, I'll talk to both of you um. I'm sure soon. And Jimmy yeah. Sorelli, uh, you can come back on maybe in a couple of weeks and we'll go over mm -hmm. some of the stuff that I didn't get to use tonight. Definitely. Hopefully we'll get the kinks uh, with these computers and all this other stuff. And uh, Jimmy was great uh, converting with you. And I'll, I'll send you something on Instagram. And uh, whenever you're ready. Yep. Stay in touch, baby. Definitely. See you soon. All right, guys. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yep. See you soon. Bye-bye. Peace. All right, guys, that was great. I had a ball. See, I knew that uh, that those two guys kind of had an interest in uh, talking, getting to know each other a little bit. And when Jimmy Calandro offered me earlier today to come on, you know, and join the show a little bit, I thought it was a great idea. I said, you know what, if you don't mind, that'd be great. Maybe 10, 10 minutes or so into the show, pop on, say hello tell some stories, talk to Jimmy a little bit. And uh, it worked out great. And I was looking at the comments. It looked like you guys had a lot of fun. We discussed everything from Brooklyn to Manhattan, food, fireworks, restaurants, bakeries, 86th Street, which I hold near and dear to my heart because I have so many good memories uh, on 86th Street under the L train. Um even, even over Queens, uh, where I lived as a kid. I love Bensonhurst, Bay Ridge, Diker Heights. Um, so that's it, guys. I think I'm going to cut it off for the night. I'm going to go spend some time with my wife, say goodnight to my stepson, and uh, I'm going to get some sleep. Just to update you guys, I didn't get a phone call yet. You know, I was waiting on one. Uh, I'm not giving up hope. Hopefully tomorrow or something, I'll get some good news and I'll keep you guys posted. Thank you, everybody, for uh, emailing and messaging me on Instagram, asking me how the interview went and if I if I heard anything back yet. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight, for the super chats, for everything. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. This is the kind of stuff I want to do more of. This is the kind of stuff I love. See, uh, Kenneth Douglas says, that's what I subscribed for. And Kenneth, you have my word. You're going to be getting more of it. Ken C says, great show, FBS. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, shit. All right, I lost Ken C. He said, great show, FBS. U.S. Army Combat Medic, thank you for your service. Uh, he says, great show. Uh, Nicozy Connection says, good luck. Thank you. Lexi Johnson, take care, FBS. Everyone else, see you all soon. Yeah, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. And this is the kind of stuff I'm going to be doing more of. Uh, I'm going to get away from all the bullshit, all the drama. No, uh, none of us need it in our lives. And I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to do what I love to do and provide the best content I can. Jimmy Calandra says, to all the people in the chat room, have a good night and stay safe. And thank you again, Jimmy. All right, everybody. I love you guys. Oh, Tom Lochner, 499. Thank you so much for that last minute uh, super chat. Thank you for life. I will tell her you said hi and this can't be wrong. All right, guys. I love you all and I'll see you next time. Salute.